Hello and welcome. Uh, this is Deep Source Live episode one. And we have Massimiliano Pippi uh, as a guest on Deep Source Live episode one today. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, what engineering teams who have started to work remotely for the very first time, uh, what are the challenges they are facing and how they can mitigate those. Uh, I'm Sinket, I'm founder of Deep Source. Deep Source is a static analysis tool that helps you discover and automatically fix issues in your code uh, in your pull request workflow. And and yeah, I'd let Massey take the lead here. Massey, would love, would love it if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. So thanks for having me here today. Uh, my name is Massey. Uh, I work as a senior software engineer at Arduino. Uh, specifically, I am on the platform team. It's a completely uh, remote team. Uh, before Arduino, I was at Datadog, where, where I had the chance to uh, be an individual contributor, as well as uh, managing uh, several different engineering teams. And also at Datadog, I had the chance to work in different uh, remote layouts, let's say. Uh, we went from a hybrid distributed team between different offices around the world to a fully uh, distributed remote team uh, towards the end uh, of my time here. Uh, before that, dog, I had my own company. And yeah, but basically I define myself as a software engineer mainly. Uh, I like, I just like to tinker with code and stuff. Awesome. Uh, before we get into the conversation, a uh, couple of quick things we will be recording this entire cast and it will be available on YouTube for uh, people to consume later. And there is a, there is a Q and A section here. So we will be taking questions. You can ask your questions anytime during the, uh, the session and we'll be taking a 15 minute Q and A, uh, you know, a section for 15 minutes uh, at the end. And we'll be fielding the questions to Massey at the end. Uh, so please feel free to ask any questions. Um, so let's, let's, I, I, I will Start off with asking a couple of things uh, from your experience. So, Massey, you have been working remotely uh, for almost twenty years, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's like a lot of experience. And uh, post COVID nineteen, a lot of companies, like even even for us, like at Deep Source, we started working remotely uh, for the first time, and a lot of companies had to do that. Um, what are the top five things or top three things that you see that people who have never worked remotely, like maybe counterintuitive things uh, that people face when they start working remotely for the first time? Uh, yeah. So uh, first of all, there is something that uh, I really want to stress uh, because sometimes we tend to overlook these kind of things. But when you have a, a team, if you have just one person remote, you have to reason like it was an entire like full remote team. And this is especially important because I see now, because of the, of the pandemic, many, many, uh, not only engineering teams, but many teams in general are moving uh, full remote. And it's a problem to keep up, especially with communication, for example. If you, I mean, we know we have a lot of tools we can use. Uh, we have Slack, we have real time chats, we have the emails. Uh, but the, the most important things that I see not everybody uh, cares enough about is about aligning expectations. Uh, so for example, if you uh, tend to use emails, but then you Slack me like 30 seconds after you send my the email, hey, did you check my email? Like that doesn't work. So first of all, you have to align uh, expectations. There are some tools that are meant to be synchronous and that's fine. And there are other tools that, that, that are meant to be asynchronous. So the important thing is to use the right tool in the right uh, situation. And this brings me to the second point that I uh, really care about. And it's about relationships. So sometimes if you're working in, in the office, you have plenty of uh, you know, opportunities to say hi to a colleague, to take a coffee, uh, meet at the kitchen and, you know, spend some words. So one, one piece of advice I want to, uh, to give is keep doing that. Even if you are at home, uh, just 
you know, take five minutes to, to chat to a colleague just to say hi and how, how they are doing and whatever. You know, the same you would do uh, in the office. And then uh, you asked me the top five. I don't know if I can uh, go to, to five, but another thing that I care about is, I would say it's trust. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to, uh, to have trust in somebody. And when you see them every day, uh, you see them at lunch, you see them in the morning, you, you see them uh, when you leave the office, it's extremely important to keep up with trust, even if those people uh, start working from home. So you, you, you don't see them anymore every, you know, every minute uh, of the day. Yeah. So communication. And, so yeah, the first thing that you said, it's very, very interesting. Communication and setting expectations in communication. I think that's, that's something that's very important. Like today, everyone is using Slack or some sort of, you know, real time mes messaging. And as you said, you know, you send an email and then you ask that, hey, did you see, did you see my email? So how do you think, you know, in your experience, how do you think people like teams can do this systematically? Like setting these expectations systematically, do you think that comes implicitly as part of the team's culture or that is something that can be systematically documented or maybe propagated somehow? Uh, so it's something, it, I would say uh, a big component of this, it's culture. So it's much, much easier if you already have a culture that it's, that, that's ready for this. But on top of a good culture, you have to put in place, uh, uh, you know, you have to write docs uh, and you have to define procedures, let's say. Uh, so yeah, for example, like if, you, if you're doing Kanban, uh, you, you just cannot have uh, the Kanban board uh, hanging in the office anymore. That's it. You have to... Yeah. You have to switch to something else and you have to make something else the source of truth. Uh, then, you know, if somebody in the office, office uh, wants to mirror the uh, online Kanban, fine by me, uh, you can uh, post it on the, on the wall. But yeah, I would say it's procedures and uh, a good culture. That's right. why, but I, I understand it's hard because if you already have somebody remote before the pandemic, probably you already have faced these kind of issues. If one day, like suddenly uh, you find yourself uh, alone at home, uh, that, that's much, much harder. So I, I wouldn't say it's easy. Right. Uh, you have to of take course. your time to Of course. And especially when you know, you've never worked uh, remotely before, uh, then I, th I think there's an implicit trust between, like amongst the team members, because they are in, the, in, in front of each other like almost every day. And then once you're not working physically, when you're working 100% remote, like all of a sudden, and that's one of the things that I wanted to touch upon, when you're working all of a sudden, remotely all of a sudden, then that, that touch kind of, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Some people follow can sprints, right? So, what else can other processes can bring this thing systematically, the trust factor systematically within a team? Uh, I I would say trust is uh, this is mostly for uh, engineering managers. I I would say uh, they have to uh, lead by example by you know putting trust in in the team. And at least this is my, my, my point of view. Because I, I don't think you can really uh, have a, a checklist for a building trust. It's something that you have to build day after day. And it's much, much easier to, to trust a colleague than to trust you know, your manager or for your manager to trust you, especially if you know, one day you are at the office and the day after you are at home. And uh, so yeah I, yeah, I wouldn't say there is a specific checklist you have to, it, it's a continuous improvement you have to do, uh, even with small things, you know, but, oh, for example, uh, sometimes it happens to me, uh, 
you know, uh, the other on the other party doesn't turn on the, the, the webcam. That, that's bad. My advice would be always turn on your webcam. Because, for example, you are used to, your, to, to see your manager, you know, in a good suite every day. And then one, <laughs> one day you can see uh, their room, uh, you know, maybe with laundry on the back. And this is a big, you know, this is a big step in terms of trust. And it's a little thing because maybe that random day you just turn on the camera, but it's a big leap for, you know, for your relationship uh, with your teammate or with your boss or with somebody on your team. Uh, so I would say uh, that's, that's, a that's actually a very good point. Movement. That's actually a very good point. Right. That's actually a very good point that, you know, uh, so, you know, bringing the parallels between when you're working physically, you know, you see someone eight hours a day or uh, whatever that time is, but you see them through all their phases, right? Like in the morning, maybe they come into the office and they are cranky. And then, you know, during the lunch, you have a heart to heart conversation and then you see them being productive or not being productive. Uh, so I think what you said is, is, is actually very interesting when you always turn on the webcam and it's, it's a small detail, then you actually get to get to have a peek in their personal lives, like a small peek. And that kind of humanizes the video experience, yeah. maybe. And uh, that's 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 a very good that's a very good uh, that's a very good point. So moving on, uh, I want to talk about uh, tooling. So what kind of tools like have you used uh, in your previous companies? Specifically talking about Datadog or Arduino. Uh, since you've been working 100% remote and your team has been remote. So what kind of tooling uh, uh, did you use to do sp some of these things specifically, right? So for example, sprint planning or, you know, maybe standups or check-ins or anything in the middle, what do you do during the day? Yeah. So uh, I really, really like to keep things as easy as possible. I want to reduce the overhead in because it's twofold. As a manager, I want to reduce the overhead of the management. And for the guys, uh, I like them to have, you know, they don't, I don't want them to spend too much time in setting up stuff and moving things around. So back when I was at Datadog, we heavily rely on Trello for pretty much anything mm -hmm. from backlog review through planning, through tracking, you know, the, the roadmap, even longer term roadmaps we tried to put everything on Trello. Uh, it was tricky because Trello has some clear limitations, but that's by design. So you have to cope with that. And this is, a, this, this is actually a good thing because Trello doesn't try to be something else. It's just as easy as you, right. uh, as you see it. Uh, so, but we prefer to, you know, to build uh, some sort of, you know, to use the tool in a certain way we prefer that uh, over, you know, uh, using something much, much, much more complex and hard to use. And for example, at Arduino, we use Jira. And it makes sense because we want to have one tool for the whole company. But Arduino is very peculiar because we do, you know, everything from hardware to software as a service product. So finding one, mm -hmm. if you want to use one tool to fit any possible use case, it has to be big and it has to be complex. So that's, that's a little bit different. If I can choose, I, I would prefer having something like uh, Trello because the easier, the better. Right. And yeah, for uh, right. other things, uh, other, another tool that we heavily used was of course Slack, but not just for uh, real-time communication, uh, we also use Slack to do stand-ups because uh, my teams were distributed mm -hmm. around the world, like geographically distributed. So you cannot have a stand-up meeting at 9 a.m. or right. 10 a.m. <laughs> for, for everybody. It's, it's a mess. So we use Slack, like specific Slack channels to, to do our stand-up so that for mm -hmm. the manager, it was good because you had, uh, you know, Slack uh, puts the, uh, the, the time uh, the day, sorry, the day uh, is it's some sort of uh, line between as days. a divider. So for, yeah, uh, uh, the divider. So for the manager, you can look at the divider and you have uh, the stand up for the day. And for the engineers is like, right. 
Right. Oh yeah, no big deal. I just have to send a message to to Slack. That's easy. Yeah, and yeah, I would say yes. Yeah, I, I think these two friendly. tools are something that people who are not who are not working remotely. Right. Yeah, so I think these are something that people you know remotely they use as well. So when you're shifting to, you don't necessarily need uh, new tools. Uh, you know, because you know, too many tools, you know, can be problematic, as you said, setting up and maintaining too many tools and buying too many tools can be a problem. Uh, yeah, some piece of, of advice I want to give is like, uh, if you already have the tools, try to make them work. At the same time, don't be afraid to introduce new, new mm -hmm. tools. Because it's extremely important that you, uh, you have to make the remote team mm -hmm. work. So don't be afraid to introduce something new. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, if you, right. in our case, we already had Slack, it was working, why not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to shift to talking about productivity uh, for a moment. So one of the things that, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, we, we kind of, you know, face ourselves, like, as I, as I mentioned, uh, at DeepSource, we have been 100% more team. Like, we have an office in Bangalore and the entire team there. Uh, and then after COVID, uh, we started working 100% remote. And in it seems like we've lost uh, some kid there for a while. So I think he was trying to ask about productivity and how that uh, kind of you know affects for teams moving for the first time remote. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna give you a back takeover. Yeah. So yeah. So the question that I was asking, uh, the question that I was asking was. Uh, from productivity. So what do you do in terms of, you know, as an individual person, like as a, as a worker, what do you ensure? How do you ensure that you are staying productive? And then as an engineering manager or a leader, how do you ensure that, you know, your team is staying productive and uh, nudge them towards, you know, ensuring that they're being productive? Uh, yeah. So uh, first of all, even that there is one specific difference in the pandemic situation. Even if I've been, you know, a remote worker for most of my career, uh, I'm working from home like since one just one year, and it's 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 completely different. Uh, working from home is different from working from a working space. And during the pandemic, probably you have kids at home, uh, you have maybe your significant others at home. That's much much more uh, difficult. So my advice to stay productive uh, is to try to make every day like, like a normal day. So uh, you wake up, wake up at a, don't wake up the, you know, the last five minutes, uh, wake up early, uh, get dressed. This is, this seems stupid to say, but actually uh, it helps. And if you can try to go outside, try to do something to make your day normal uh, because even if you are working at home, uh, it's very, very important to, uh, you know, to, to keep separated your house from your office, even if uh, the office is in your house. Uh, so from the manager perspective, my advice would be to uh, check in very often. Of course, not to micromanage, uh, but like check in, like, do you need anything? Uh, is everything okay? How about the kids? Uh, can I help in any way? My advice for managers is try to help your, uh, your folks. Uh, try to see if they need anything uh, because chances are they need help, but they won't reach out to ask you. Uh, so be proactive and especially now, because now it's, even for me, I have my uh, home office, but maybe you can say from the background, I have to share my home office with my two kids. <laughs> so it's, it's harder than usual, even if you have a good setup. Imagine if you don't even have a setup. That's, so yeah. for managers, like really ask, ask your guys if, if they need anything. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think, you know, maybe hosting random calls during the day when you don't talk about work, like say water cooler conversations and things like that, that generally, you know, that don't happen really when you're working remotely. Right, unless you make a point to do it explicitly, you set aside that hey, okay, we are going to do this or something like that. Like that spontaneity is not there. So I think that is something that you know we have to mimic. Like people who are working remotely, they have to mimic 
uh, what happens in an office. Uh, because as you say, the personal connection is, is lost in some, in some ways. Right? Uh, yeah, it's extremely important. Let's keep relationships alive. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, talking a little more about processes here. So we talked about, you know, we talked about using Kanban boards um, and documentation. Uh, what about, what about things like code reviews? Uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm sure that code reviews are something that generally might not get affected a lot because, you know, essentially if you're using GitHub or something like any other tool, you basically do code reviews uh, online anyways, right? But what I want to touch, touch upon here is when you're working in a distributor team, the first point that you mentioned about expectations, right? Uh, how do you cope up with that? Like, you know, if I'm making, uh, if I'm making some code changes here and then I would expect that, you know, these things would be, uh, would be reviewed sooner uh, rather than later. And the person who is going to be reviewing, they might be in a different time zone or they might be not, you know, working today. And you might not know that, right? So things like those. So how do you cope up with that? Like, what are your tips around that? Uh, yeah, so to uh, to keep up with different time zone, uh, I won't lie, it's hard. It's hard to sell. And you have to be very, very good to plan your work in a way that uh, when your day is over, the next team from the next time zone can take over easily. Uh, but that that's hard. That's hard because not, not always you have, you know, the, the work is not broken down in a way that's easy to be picked up uh, sequentially by different teams. But mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, something that, uh, first of all, I want to say you are completely right. Uh, even if you might expect that doing code reviews on GitHub is remote or asynchronous anyways, when you are in the office, it, ha it happens very often, at least to me, that you sit down, sit down side by side with your colleagues and your colleagues talks you through the code, shows you some code, shows how, how it works. So when you go back to the, the code review, you already know everything. Even if there are not enough information in the pull request, or even if, hmm. you know, you already uh, attended the show. So it's easier. When you're remote, this doesn't happen easily. Uh, it, it can still happen. You can still do paid programming, but you know, uh, remotely it's much more difficult. Yeah. So it's important to, uh, to have proper pull requests and communication again is key. That's why, for example, at Datadog, at some point we introduced um, some sort of procedure that was very, very similar to an RFC document. So before starting adding a measure feature to the piece of software, we used to discuss everything in a text document and so that the team could chime in and once the design was clear, code reviews were much, much easier because you know the big picture. Uh, right. You know what's the final goal. So if you are reviewing some code, that, that's the first step towards the final goal, you know where are we going, it's much, much easier. Right. Uh, so this is another practice that we introduced because we had to, because we were distributed, but it won't hurt in, you know, if, even if you are at the office. Yeah. Uh, it's a good practice. Yeah, I think that kind of connects back to the documentation, um, the focus on documentation that we discussed earlier um, in the conversation. Uh, you know, when you're now that you're making a code review, you know that you're, when you're making a pull request, you know that you're not going to be able to sit next to the code reviewer. So you might want to add more context in the, in the pull request. And ties back to documentation that, you know, as you said, RFCs or you know, the specs, like writing proper specs. So you might now want to add more details in the spec, like, you know, go the extra mile, you know, add, add some more details, some more context, because you might not be able to, you know, have that spontaneous one-on-one -on -one conversation that you had in the office. Like there are these, you know, light bulb moments at times uh, that, that, that only happens when you are like having that water cooler conversation or going out for a walk or something like that. Uh, but that doesn't happen here. So I think that is one of the caveats of remote work here that, you know, those light bulb moments might not happen. Um, but to kind of sum it up here, I think, uh, I think that kind of makes sense, you know, especially in terms of these processes, uh, 
you know, documentation, focus on documentation and code review. This is how it changed. I, I wonder how it has changed for you, Masi, uh, after COVID, how, how did code reviews change for you? Uh, this, 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 is a, this is an interesting question because, uh, so for me, it didn't change much except one thing, which is now I have my kids at home. Uh, mm -hmm. So schools are closed. And that's hard. That's much, much harder than I expected. Um, uh, because you have to, uh, you know, you have to find the time to, uh, for, for them, you have to find the time to help them uh, with their homeschooling. They do um, Zoom calls as well. So you have to arrange your <laughs> meetings so that you don't have, uh, you know, four Zoom meetings going on with your uh, home connection. Uh, so I, it wasn't easy. It was easy for me personally because it didn't change much uh, my root, my daily routine, you know, uh, except I cannot go to the gym anymore, but except that it didn't change much. Mm -hmm. But for uh, uh, from the work perspective, it's much, much harder now. I'm slightly less focused. I need to find the time for everything. I need to plan carefully uh, my meetings. I had to talk. Uh, my kids into what I'm doing, why it's important, uh, why I need those 30 minutes, uh, why I need them to stay quiet for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it takes some work. Got it. Got it. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, uh, that kind of, that kind of makes a lot of sense. I think as we, as people who have never started, never worked remotely, now that they're starting, starting to work remotely, I think documentation processes, a little more effort should go into that. And a little more effort into maybe time management as well, personal time management. Um, so one of the things that I personally, uh, you know, I personally uh, uh, struggled with is not having these start and end times. And I saw a lot of people discussing that, you know, a lot of people saying that you need to have, as you said, get dressed up and for work. Right, even if you're working from home, and that kind of sets a you know that, that that sets a virtual kind of a boundary to your start time and end time, and that is something that you know doesn't come come across as a common sense thing when people are working from home. Like you could be just working from your couch all day long, and never know the starts and ends, and that can make you very much unproductive. Right. Uh, yeah, this is another thing that I think it's important to stress when, especially when you when. Uh, and to look out, especially when you are a manager, because it, it's true that that's easier when you work remote, but it, it, it can also happen at the office. Mm -hmm. so it, happen, it happens to myself. Uh, I used to work for Datadog uh, in Paris, and you know, I was alone, so I, I tended to spend so much time at the office just because I was enjoying what I was doing. So having like a clear uh, routine for your day, it's always important. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's especially important if you work from home. Uh, but this is another thing that uh, you need to build up some culture in your team. You got it. I think. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so let's take some uh, let's take some questions. We have a couple of interesting questions. Um, so there's a. Can you please touch on a little on hiring remote, training them, and bringing them on track with other employees. This is from Nitin. Uh, I'll just repeat the question. Masi, you can see the question, I guess, as well. Yes, yes, I see the question. Uh, yeah. Okay, can I? Okay, yeah, can I go, go ahead. I see, yeah, okay. go ahead. So uh, about hiring, uh, that's probably mm, the easiest part, I would say. Uh, because depending on your hiring pipeline, uh, but probably you already are taking uh, remote interviews, like the phone call screening, the probably the coding interview. Uh, so it's just a matter to extend uh, your interview practices to, to be completely uh, remote. The most difficult part for me was to move uh, the design interview which is an interview that I like to do at the whiteboard with the candidate. I really love these kind of interviews because it's like uh, you, uh, you, you know, you know so much about the candidate during that uh, half an hour spent together at the, the, at the whiteboard. And I, I really miss it. And there isn't 
an easy solution to that. I tried different tools. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was challenging to, to shift from in-person to, uh, to remote. The other parts of the interview, I wouldn't say uh, I miss them so much. One thing that probably, and this is different if your company is full remote by design or if you are going remote for the first time or you are remote just because of the pandemic. Because mm -hmm. one thing that's important and it's missing is the candidate impression of the office. So it's not just for us who hire, uh, it's, it's also for the, uh, the folks being hired. Having the chance to hang on, hang, hanging on at the office, having maybe a lunch, see uh, you know, the, the environment, that's very, very important and you're missing that. Uh, so this is another thing to, to keep in mind. About the onboarding, I would say uh, sometimes we tend to uh, underestimate onboarding. Even if you have the office, if you don't have a clear onboarding procedure, it's going to be a mess, a poor experience for the new hire. So my advice is be strong on the onboarding techniques. And if you have a strong onboarding procedure, trust me, it's going to work uh, remotely. Uh, it's going to work mm -hmm. anyways. Uh, for the, uh, the third point, I think, was like blending. Uh, Bringing them back. The other. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's again, that's hard. And I think it's very, very important for the manager to step in and to handle the situation. Probably it's a good idea to find a buddy in the team. Mm. So you, you pick one of the guys and you say, look, uh, nothing technical, but reach out to the guy, be sure that the onboarding procedure is going good, is going well. Uh, ask them about anything, take a coffee, uh, uh, whatever, take a beer at 6 p.m. or whatever it takes to, to, get, to get them more comfortable. And so it's not easy. And again, maybe it's something that you have to do anyways in the office, because especially, you know, if you have 100 people in the office, maybe uh, alienating anyways, even if it's yeah. not remote, but you don't know what to do, what <laughs> you don't know who is who. So it's right. a bit of a, of a problem anyways. Yeah. And adding to that, you know, as, as you said, you know, uh, in a post, like in a hundred percent remote world, uh, you always miss again, the same, I keep coming back to the human connection because I think it's very important when you're hiring someone, like when, like when I do hiring, like I really want to meet someone first, like at least once, right? Because that kind of gives you a very good idea of what kind of person they are. Uh, but that is one thing that, you know, that's very difficult to attain when you're just talking over, over, over video. But I think that can be somehow mitigated if you talk to them long enough, maybe like for a longer time. So, yeah. Uh, the second question would be, the second question is from someone anonymous. Uh, what do you think will be the future of the deaf community? Will work from home will be preferred forever? This is a very, I think it's a polarizing question. What do you think about this, Masi? Uh, so I really, I would really like this to be the future. I think it's going to be the future. But for example, I really love your initiative for this webinar because these days, I'm trying to convince people that working remotely and working from home, in some cases, it's better for everybody. So I really hope this can be the future. And while I see uh, some areas where this is not possible uh, mm -hmm. intrinsically, but for us in the dev community, uh, we should at least try to make this the norm and not an emergency. Right. As in, you know, it, it kind of, if you look at the news, Shopify just announced that they would be until 2021, they would be remote first and then they'd be permanently remote. Uh, Twitter and Square announced yeah. that they would be 100% remote. So I think the large tech companies, they have already started to move in this direction. Um, uh, only a few companies have said that the category categorically said that they would, they don't want to do this. Like I think Microsoft was the one, the big one. Uh, I think they say that they don't want to do remote. Um, but, but yeah, I think a lot of soft, if you think about it, a lot of open source software has been built a hundred percent remote anyways. Right. And, and a lot of the, like a lot of really, really good software projects are hundred percent remote, like Linux, for example, or Python projects like Django. And they're like 
top notch quality of work um so at least i think what you said is is, is very very you know it's 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 actually very uh, you know uh, it, it's it's right that it's easier to implement this in the dev community like for developers it's easier to do that it might not be as easy to to do this for other functions maybe marketing or sales i'm not sure uh, but um but do you really think that this is going to be the future of engineering like for for companies i believe so uh, especially because again there are few types of different types of remote work okay mm -hmm. so uh, even if a fully remote company is won't be the case for every, for anybody in the future but at least even if you have two offices even if you mm -hmm. have one office in india and one office in the us you are remote that's yeah. that's that, that's the truth and i mean even from the business side, you don't want to lose the opportunity to hire the best talents just because of a visa problem or yeah. of whatever problem. Uh, when you can easily, you know, uh, work around the problem by working remote. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's one of the largest. That, that's one of the biggest uh, uh, plus ones. Like that, that's one of the biggest arguments for remote work. That you know you don't have to lose out on talent because of you know relocation problems and i think a lot of companies who are going full remote like for example gitlab uh, famously has been 100% remote since day one they have a very good documentation around their culture on around their operating model and um, of course there has been some criticism of, as well but generally they have been kind of the front runners if i'm not wrong uh, uh, but yeah that's like i think i think that's one of the one of the largest plus ones on why you should adopt remote like access to talent all across the globe that's simply one of the biggest things that that can be a game changer for a lot of startups if you think about it um yeah yeah but i i think i think to to kind of sum it up uh, from the conversation that we had uh, focus on focus on processes focus on more documentation comes up and focus on humanizing uh, you know more effort should be taken on humanizing the relationships in an all video world like turning turning the webcam on always i think i think i'm going to adopt it personally like all the time that's something that's that's super i i really like that um uh is there anything else uh in your mind that you want to add to this uh, beyond what we already discussed uh uh oh maybe uh just one last thing uh another thing i i really care about uh is about coaching uh, mm -hmm. it's so easy to coach somebody when you share an office or a desk. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, please take the extra effort to, and keep coaching your colleagues, keep coaching your teammates, uh, even if it's going to be much, much harder, uh, right? Because, you know, you are at home, they are at home. You don't want to interrupt anything. So, uh, it's, it's very, very easy to say, oh, I'll, I'll tell him tomorrow. I'll tell him another day. Uh, no, right. they, they try, try to interrupt, try to keep coaching, try to keep grow uh, as a team. Uh, there's one more, there's one more question. One last question I think we can take uh, from, an, from someone anonymous. What are the most basic things that engineering team should keep documented? That's a good one. Ha. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough question. That's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, probably whatever it takes to keep the the bus factor, uh, you know, pretty pretty high. That mm -hmm. I would document everything. Or let's say uh, if you want to go on vacation and you don't want any blocker, write the documentation you need to go on vacation at, at any given time. You know, without. <laughs> being right. afraid that you uh, your boss is going to uh, ask you something uh, yeah i think that's a nice framework to think about like what if you i want to go on a vacation what are the things that people can call me at 2 a.m in the morning about so make sure uh, that that gets documented <laughs> but i think you know if i might add to this um, maybe the 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 basic processes around collaboration like how say something basic right uh, which which people think might come co intuitively, but it, it, sometimes it doesn't. 
like say how do you how do you use say for example tasks how to create tasks how to tag these tasks right uh, from a basic sanity perspective and then where is something that i want to find like where is documentation like meta documentation about documentation like uh, in a lot of cases there is some documentation around how to do something but it's just hidden somewhere that people are not able to find it right so i think those are some of the basic sanity things that should be documented uh from the from the entire team's perspective and 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 i, and I think from a individual perspective what you said is a very good rule of thumb we can have we can have it like we can say we can we can term it as a vacation test maybe uh, yeah <laughs> I, i really love your uh, your idea of the meta documentation i'm going to steal this <laughs> yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah and and yeah the vacation test maybe you know that that could be a thing you know i'm going to write about it uh, that you know what if i want to go on a vacation how do i prevent my other teammates to from calling me at 2 am in the morning right yeah i had a boss one, once that who told me uh, my you know my best achievement was that time when i went on vacation and nobody noticed <laughs> that, that means that everything is working properly you, you, you right right yeah yeah um great i think we are uh, out of questions uh, this has been great uh, thanks a lot masi for your time uh, we have one last question that just came in um uh, how embedded system engineering team this is from sayed how embedded system engineering team can work better in remotely uh, there are many dependencies between the hardware and software to complete the project okay you should have a better uh, context to answer this uh yeah and <laughs> uh this is this is uh, another question uh it's not easy you know uh i don't think you can go full remote uh if you have um, a hardware uh process line uh for example in our case we uh we had to keep it for arduino uh we had to keep our production plant up and running and somebody had to go there Uh, despite the pandemic that there are no uh, work around and few guys from the uh, hardware team had to go back to the office and collect you know the fancy stuff uh, you made right. in the you this in the laboratory you need uh, uh you, you need your shop you know so that probably the uh, the firmware engineer they can work remote because they get maybe an advanced uh, prototype or something to work on from their houses uh, but for the yeah uh, hardware it's not going to work <laughs> yeah. i think i think that's one of the things that is inevitable as in you can't possibly make everything remote uh, but i think you know uh, how we should structure how we could structure the teams as you know each teams teams need to functions like apis uh you know and 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 the interfaces should be clearly defined and then there should be seamless communication of course easier said than done but i think yeah. it it kind of becomes more and more critical as you move to more working more remotely right but yeah this is this is like this is, uh, again the same thing i think this is one of the things that cannot be seamlessly you know uh, move to 100% remote like hardware teams for example right so uh, yeah uh, probably it, it was asking to work better Uh, so okay. probably uh yeah maybe there is i don't know uh for example at arduino every engineer uh has plenty of hardware so they ship us uh the the, the things that most most likely we we are going to need for mm -hmm. tinkering mm -hmm. uh so this can help for sure so yeah maybe this is something I, i would do be sure that everybody has the same rig in terms of technology so you nobody is blocked because right. i'm working on a module for something and a serial monitor for a specific piece of hardware and then i don't have that hardware to test and block right. try not to make this happen uh, right uh, yeah. yeah yeah makes sense uh and what are the question are all work from home engineers music enthusiasts well they become one i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i think they become probably. one yeah uh, uh even if since since the pandemic has started i didn't find the time anymore to play guitar oh wow uh, because with the ki with the kids at home it's just not uh, you know any hobby i had before it's it's over it's done <laughs> right 
I so, hope schools will reopen soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, I think it's time to uh, it's time to wrap up. Um, thanks a lot, Massey, for taking out the time. Uh, uh, it was it was amazing talking to you about all these things. I hope it was useful for our attendees. Uh, one quick reminder: for the event there would be a feedback form that will be sent to everyone who's attending. Uh, please give us your feedback. It will help us figure out how do we make Deep Source Live better. What else can we do? Uh, in Deep Source Live, what other topics can we talk about? And uh, again, the, the recordings will be shared after, uh, afterward on our YouTube channel. Uh, take a look at our Twitter. And I think we'll send an email to everyone as well. Um, again, thanks a lot, Massey. Uh, this has been great. Thank you guys for having me. It was super fun. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>